Section 1 of Captain Billy's Whizbang, Volume 2, Number 20, May 1921. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Captain Billy's Whizbang, Volume 2, Number 20, May 1921, by W. H. Fawcett. Dedication. Captain Billy's Whizbang, America's Magazine of Wit, Humor, and Philosophy, published monthly at Robbinsdale, Minnesota. We have room for but one sole loyalty, and that is loyalty to the American people. Theodore Roosevelt. Edited by a Spanish and World War veteran and dedicated to the fighting forces of the United States. Drippings from the Faucet Out on Rural Route No. 2, we haven't much class, as the saying goes, but we have a lot of fun. We haven't any bright lights, although the folks about the country have thought so liberally of my little bundle of bunk lately that I've been able to put in a small farm lighting plant in the Whizbang house, barn, and yard. Not many Minnesota farmers can afford, in these low wheat price days, such a luxury as an electric lighting plant, and so the one put in at the Whizbang farm created quite an interest. Gus, our hired man, thought it would be a good idea to have a sort of celebration over the new electric lights. The idea met with instant approval from Mrs. Bill and the kids. The next question was how to celebrate the great event. Gus suggested a snooze party, but as not all of my neighbors chew the Copenhagen breakfast food, his suggestion received a cool reception, particularly from Mrs. Bill, who dislikes the habit. It was left to my 12-year-old daughter to solve the problem later in the day when I discovered her in the loft of the old red barn practicing toe dancing. This suggested to my mind a dancing party. And so we gave the party. I wired the hay loft with electric lights and dumped a pail full of oatmeal on the floor to make it slippery. We picked Gus as the dance master, and here was his predominating action for the evening. On a balmy night, when the weather's clear, the boys and girls from far and near will congregate on the Whizbang farm to cut some capers in the old red barn. We have a drum and a Jew's harp, too. Jim Moss plays on the tin bazoo, and a fiddler over from Sugar Creek. Pick him up, Silas, and lay him down deep. Oh, we'll dance all night to the latest tune, the maiden's prayer or the old hip croon. We'll walk the dog and ball the jack and promenade around the old haystack. The horses nicker and the roosters crow. Balance all and away you go. Dance that one step nice and clean, possum trot and the lima bean. Now swing around like the old barn door. If the music stops, then holler more or pinch your gal on her rosy cheek. Pick him up, Silas, and lay him down deep. Pick him up, Silas, and lay him down deep. Ain't no game of hide-and-seek. Pick them knot-holes from the floor. Change your partners, forward four. Hear the music to your feet. Pick him up, Silas, and lay him down deep. The only fault we had to find with Gus's musical attainments was that he didn't say anything about the dang-busted lighting plant going on the blink during the dance. Something went wrong and the lights went out, and when we came to again, I was horrified. Mrs. Bill says we can't give any more dances, not if those girls from Sugar Creek are allowed to attend. Here it is spring. The poets are with us, and the Thursday musicales can now render The Coming of Spring by a scanty Aphrodite girly in true aesthetic rhythm, but I hearken not to their artificial atmosphere. I crave Mother Nature in all its ruggedness. Hence I have fared to my log cabin settlement on the shores of Big Pelican Lake in northern Minnesota, accompanied by Mrs. Bill, the five kids, my dog Shep, our new perfumed Persian pussy, and, last but not least, the good old pedigree bull, Pedro. Fred LePage, my French-Canadian friend, and lord and master of the Pequot settlement, threw in a couple of cows in the deal, wherein I acquired title to the cabins and the shore property, and advised me to bring the pedigreed bull along to keep the cowlets company. And so here we are at Pequot, 
And as I said before, it is spring, and the birdies are singing in the treelets. We've hardly been here a week, when into our wild and wooded midst enters, like an angel from heaven, a pretty young miss, a graduate of Minneapolis aristocracy, and unlearned in the ways of we simple country folk. She has never seen a real pumpkin sprout in the garden of nature, and her knowledge of the products of the soil was confined to what she had read in some seminary institution. The first evening, Gus, our hired man, picked some of Brother LePage's wild asparagus. We did it up in butter, as was my wife's custom, and served it in big helpings on the old pine table. Miss B., our guest and new acquaintance, was guided by etiquette, and started to eat her asparagus with a knife and fork. But Gus changed her mind. Now Gus is a careless sort of fellow. When he surrounds a plate of grub, he is like time and tide. He waits for no man. He simply surrounds his lips, arms, fingers, and what not in mad haste to consume everything on the table. He is oblivious to anything or anyone else. So Gus grabbed the butt end of a big stalk of asparagus and sipped the tip of the vegetable in much the same fashion as a steam suction hose cleaned the streets of Paris in her soldier days. But Miss B was game. In manner demure, she nervously grasped a luscious piece within her slender fingers. Blushingly, she placed the tender morsel between her pearly teeth. She was a game little girlie, despite her embarrassment. The warm butter slobbered over her, but, to her credit, may it be said, she went through the ordeal much like a seasoned veteran. At this writing, I am glad to say, our angel is rapidly becoming accustomed to backwood etiquette, and now she can eat away at any size asparagus just as well, well, almost as efficiently as Gus. I said almost. It would be impossible, I believe, to equal his record. At last, thank God, Mrs. Bill admits I have one good quality— that of being tender-hearted. I overheard her telling Gus that I was so tender of heart that I wouldn't kill a poor defenseless fly, or even beat a carpet. Pedro, famous pedigree bull of the Whizbang farm, has quite a reputation as a county fair prize winner. Gus, the hired man, decided he'd make a few extra dollars one week while I was tooting it up in Minneapolis, so he started charging admission to the many who came to view the noble animal. A visitor approached Gus the first day of admission charges and inquired as to the cost for himself, wife, and nine children for viewing the bull. Not a cent, promptly replied our faithful man. Come right in. I want Pedro to see you. The girls of Texas, we judge from correspondence, are madly in love with the confection known as the lollipop, or all-day sucker. We've received several complaints from lovelorn swains requesting that we ask the Texas girls to protect their tresses from the sticky lollipops. So many whiz readers have requested that we send them the automobile seat left on our farm by a daring couple while they hike to Robbinsdale to report the theft of their motor car that we have decided to retain it. An auto seat, you know, is valueless without the car. Gus is a progressive hired man. He progresses from penny ante to nickel heart games to two-bit moonshine. It's a good thing he's not very strong for the ladies. He has plenty of bad habits now. Gus is a great fellow to play pranks. Whenever he wants to chop wood around the smokehouse, he goes to the farmhouse, opens the back door, and rings the dinner bell. All the flies swarm inside and take their places in the dining room. Then Gus closes the doors behind the flies, and goes to the woodpile to work undisturbed. You have to hand it to Gus for originality. End of section one. Section two of Captain Billy's Whiz Bang, volume two, number 20, May, 1921. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Devin Eubanks Captain Billy's Whiz Bang, Volume 2, Number 20, May 1921, by W. H. Fawcett Spooky Stuff 
At a seance the other evening, the spiritualists were telling of their experiences with residents of other worlds. One man told of conversing with a ghost. Another had dined with one. A woman declared she had shaken hands with a departed friend, and others followed suit until it seemed they had exhausted the list of possible activities with spirits. We have heard the testimonials of the circle, said the medium. But so far, nobody has told of being in love with a ghost. Is there anyone here who has had that interesting experience? Has anyone ever loved a ghost? I have, lady, said an Irishman in the rear of the room. Step right up in front. I'm sure everybody will be interested in your experience, said the medium. In all my life, I've never heard of an instance of a human loving a ghost. Hell, sputtered the Irishman. I thought you said a goat. Sissified Flirts A Hollywood and Universal City writer is very indignant this month. It appears he attended a movie ball in Los Angeles and was pestered by Devan Deeries. And so he shoots us a red-hot opinion of these sissies, together with some spicy gossip of the dressing rooms. By Richmond The male sissified flirt is becoming more and more a social pest. One is liable to bump into this queer creature at any social function, regardless of its exclusiveness. Let us dwell for a moment upon the great mask ball recently held under auspices of theatrical people at the Ambassador Hotel in Los Angeles. It is the latest creation in behalf of the wealthy tourist who visits Southern California. In this huge pile, which somewhat resembles a great depot, in depth of its long corridors and maze of shops and stands, a scene of merriment occurred that has not been rivaled in the history of winter tropics. The affair was stopped, it is understood, by order of the hotel management when word freely was passed that by some hook or crook, booze was to be had on an upper floor. Just how booze might get into a great hotel and gradually cause the dance to become rather flushed may have been a problem that puzzled and nettled those responsible for the good name of the house so far as Uncle Sam is concerned. At any event, the fiddlers left and the impression went about that the hotel people weren't going to stand for the party getting rough. Into the main dining room, before the evening was well started, two of our leading male comedians strode, both with an ill-concealed bottle protruding from the usual pocket. One of these comedians is a heavy gentleman and a jolly one. The other is gaining fame as a comedian because he never is known to smile. Just what was in the bottles cannot be proved, but the incident caused some words of criticism from other members of the movie colony, who figured the boys were putting it on a little too strong in view of the assemblage present, ever ready to declare that the movies are impossible. But these two cheerful individuals, at the worst, were only mistaken if they really intended to show off or be funny or daring. Many a person present would have been glad to join them, in consideration of their hip pocket protrusion. Yet the occasion, the time, the place, and so on, made it seem a bit garish. But what about the rouge-soaked males in feminine attire, and displaying toe-to-hip extremes, garbed in lace tights, whose every movement, look, and word indicated absence of the masculine instinct as they pranked and tripped about the ballroom floor, mingling with dainty women and stalwart males, who moved uneasily away as the queer folk swung simpering and smirking among them? Take the two merry boys with the bottles in the main dining room, a little wild perhaps, and making somewhat of a show, but withal, regular men taking a lock as they found it, maybe somewhat lit up, but exuding rough masculinity in their uncouth playfulness. To be censured? 
One regular He-Man, or a party of them, invaded under ordinary circumstances by queer-acting customers, would make short shift of sissy simps and abide by the consequences, there being small reason to fear consequences. But a public gathering is different. By the way, Mildred Harris, Charlie's used to be, led the Grand March with Earl Williams. It is remembered that Williams recently, after his marriage, paid a certain lady a sum, reputed to be $40,000, as a result of a friendship which existed prior to the picture star's entrance into matrimony. They are getting to be very businesslike, these ladies. They give, but demand payment at times. But if Earl Williams parted with $40,000, his partner in the dance, Fair Mildred, was rejoicing in a little sum of $200,000 or so, which is the amount Charles is said to have settled upon her when they parted at the ways. Bookkeeping on the leaders of the Grand March, it would appear that Earl and Mildred, between them, were $160,000 ahead of the matrimonial deal, figuring Earl's loss of $40,000 and Mildred's winnings of two hundred grand. Mary and Doug did not mingle with the ballroom dancers to any extent. They are largely home folks and only drop in on occasions at a party and then usually beat it in jig time for the fireside. One of our best-known young newspaper scribes had half the house betting that he was dancing with Edna Perviance, garbed in Turkish emblems. But when she doffed her mask, it was not Edna at all, but a charming youngster of the pictures, but not well known to fame. Since Edna has been resurrected in all her beauty for Chaplin's new picture, The Kid, the former friendship between her and Chaplin has been rehashed, where the gossip mongers meet for Wednesday night meeting. Another pleasing sight was the return of Lucille Carlyle, until recently Larry Seaman's leading lady. Rumor hath it that Lucille and Larry waged a young war about something, as children will. But the soaring young funny man of filmdom and his fair partner were turtle doves who found no one to dance with but themselves. A false report went out that Bull Montana attended the ball costumed like an ape. This is untrue for two reasons. One is that Bull wasn't present, and the other that he needs no costume when imitations of a gorilla are in order. Bull's face has become his fortune, and he is proud of it. A girl may not let you kiss her, but the chances are she appreciates your wanting to. End of Section 2 Section 3 of Captain Billy's Whizbang, Volume 2, Number 20, May 1921 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Anthony Will. Captain Billy's Whizbang, Volume 2, Number 20, May 1921, by W. H. Fawcett. Whizbang Philosophy, Life's Hard Course. Whizbang Philosophy. Prohibition is morality on a jag. A good woman is chaste, so is good whiskey. Virtue, although often lost, is seldom advertised for. After man came woman, and she has been after him ever since. A woman who can love but once is pretty badly stuck on herself. It may be peculiar, but a horse can eat best without a bit in his mouth. Man is made of dust. Along comes the water wagon of fate, and his name is Mud. Before a man marries, he swears to love. After marriage, he loves to swear. Human nature shows to better advantage at a dogfight than at a prayer meeting. Love is blind. Perhaps that accounts for some of the bad shots he has made. Blessed is the man that is born of little furniture, for it shall be easier to move. Most women are both good and true. In fact, most of them are too good to be true. You can never judge the length of a woman's tongue by the size of her mouth. Love has been called miserable happiness. Not so. It is what makes happiness miserable. He is a mean father who has his whiskers shaved off because the baby likes to pull them. Some women kiss their pet dogs in preference to their husbands. 
Some men are born lucky. The girl who wishes she had been born a boy will never make a good wife. She will want to wear the pants. A pretty woman with brains usually sends some man to the devil. If she hasn't brains, she goes there herself. Some men promise to stop smoking after marriage without exacting a similar promise from the girl. If Mother Eve had been as wise as some of her daughters, what a fool she'd have made of that snake. A man will promise a woman or baby anything to keep them quiet. Sometimes he delivers the goods in the case of the baby. All of us believe in law and order, of course, but a surprisingly large number of people like to see a policeman get whipped. Of course polygamy is dreadful, but an oriental wife can come within four or five guesses of knowing where her husband spends his evenings. The wise virgins of olden days kept their lamps trimmed and burning. Those of the present day keep the gas turned low, and they manage to trim as many suckers as their predecessors. Blessed is the man that is born for women. He hath a short life and little joy. He springeth up in the morning like a huckleberry bush, and is crushed to earth at night by a mother-in-law. Life's Hard Course This bit of philosophy is as old as the hills, but like good liquor and fruits of human thought, it grows more rich and mellow with age. Its quaintness is its virtue. And so here it is again. Man comes into this world without his consent, and leaves it against his will. During his stay on earth, his time is spent in one continual round of contraries and misunderstandings. In his infancy, he's an angel. In his boyhood, he's a devil. And in his manhood, he is everything from a lizard up. In his duties, he's a damn fool. If he raises a family, he's a chump. If he raises a check, he's a crook. If he is a poor man, he is a poor manager and has no sense. If he is rich, he is dishonest but considered smart. If he's in politics, he is a gafter and a thief. If he is out of politics, you cannot place him as he is an undesirable citizen. If he donates to foreign missions, he does it for show. If he doesn't, he is stingy and a tightwad. When he comes into the world, they all want to kiss him. Before he leaves it, they all want to kick him. If he dies young, there was a great future before him. If he lives to a ripe old age, he is only in the way just living to save funeral expenses. So life is just one damn thing after another. Everything has gone down except paper and envelopes. They are stationary. End of section three. Section four of Captain Billy's Whizbang, volume two, number 20, May 1921. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Lauren Fontaine Captain Billy's Whizbang, Volume 2, Number 20, May 1921, by W. H. Fawcett Adventures of Sven What a pity, poor kitty! Dear Uncle Billy, since I writing you last time, I bane having swell time acting in moving pictures. Last week, I working in sex picture in Hollywood studio, and we got one big scene where leading man be banker faller and get fresh with hired girl while him's wife bane gone out to weekend party. A school B butler with short tail coat and gold buttons made of brass. When somebody come in a school, stand by door and take him's card on pie plate, director he say sven when banker get fresh you skull yump in and poke him's nose just like real life with plenty pep banker get fresh all right and you bet i show director i am damn good actor i poke leading man so he don't wake up till half past sax and they don't finish scene till next week leading man he get sore on me and try to get me fired but I scold told him if he ain't to shut up, I poke him again. So he keeps still and I don't lose my yob. Week behind, lass, I playing in caveman picture with whiskers glued on May face so I look like Smith Bros on Cough Drop Box. They got real elephant from Universal City and glue whiskers all over him too. So he scold be a barskadon. 
We go out in woods with a lot of other animals and monkey round all day yumping in and out hole and hill some fallers dug for cave. I meet rich woman that say she skulls star me just so soon her husband go to Seattle. She got big limonzine and diamonds and she shake her shimmy when she walking. She bane good scout all right, you bite my life, and she say I got fine physic. She like strong fowler, and she like me be strong for her. I bat your life, I get a new suit from foreman clerk, and silk shirt with blue stripe. She's standing in good with assistant director, and get me good yobs right long. I meet four more Swedes here in pictures, and they take me to place one night they call Wild Party, and I drink some cocktail I made out of prune juice and scones liniment. When I got more news, I skull let you know right off. Moving picture game bang good bet for feller with plenty pep. Goodbye, Svens Peterson. Post chips. If you see my brother Olaf, tell him I say bootleg business bane pretty good out here just now. And if he want to come out, I skull get him in on ground floor. SP. What a pity, poor kitty. There was a young man from the city who met what he thought was a kitty. He gave it a pat, said nice little cat, and they buried his clothes out of pity. End of section four. Section five of Captain Billy's Whizbang, volume two, number 20, May 1921. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Captain Billy's Whizbang, Volume 2, Number 20, May 1921, by W. H. Fawcett. Venezuela's Abominations. As full of dynamite and fusel oil as ever, Reverend Morrill returns to Minnesota this month brimful of information on the South and Central American countries which for the past three months he had been touring for the whiz-bang, and here's his first report. Incidentally, Reverend Morrill's home in Minneapolis is broken into by burglars nearly every time he goes away on a whiz-bang jaunt, and last fall he lost $3,000 worth of choice red-eye. This last trip he left a note. Dear boys, you won't find any booze or liberty bonds, but some good books, especially this Bible, which says, Thou shalt not steal. God forgive you. I do. G. L. Morrill whether or not the note was responsible is undetermined, but nothing was missing this time. By Reverend Golightly Morrill, Pastor, People's Church, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Easy is the descent to hell, except by way of Venezuela, at whose ports of entry one suffers so many inconveniences in the form of passport visé, custom fees, red tape, delay, and insolence, that if the devil wishes to sustain his reputation of a conductor of luxurious pleasure tours to the infernal regions, he should immediately get rid of his disagreeable officials there. At La Guayra, custom authorities rob the traveler of time, money, and patience. These sunburnt bandits would steal the pennies from the eyes of their dead father and body-snatch their dead grandmother to sell her entrails for sausage casings. The visitor should be on his guard, too, lest the city's dark-eyed daughters of delight steal away his heart. La Guayra Senoritas, like the scenery, are wild, beautiful, and romantic, though there are many wizened witches, rheumatic, mustachioed, and flea-bitten, who make one seasick on land. The local enchantresses give the stranger a good, bad time, as well as a choice assortment of undesirable souvenirs. It is a pestiferous port where the laudable profession of prostitution is much practiced. These moral lepers are much more dangerous than the physical ones in the big asylum in the outskirts. Gay girls throw kisses to the tenderfoot as he walks the streets, a most sanitary and microbless pastime. Here I entered a girls' school where the young misses were learning much and not missing anything, for as a practical object lesson in physiology, a naked little boy had strolled in from the street and was roaming about the room. Some of the citizens are quite devout and show their gratitude to God for his numerous blessings. I passed a saloon bearing the inscription, Gracios a Dios, thanks to God. Thus do the simple-minded people obey the scriptural command, in everything give thanks. A few minutes' train ride takes you to Makita, 
where there is a popular shrine and a more popular brewery. At the other end of town lies Makuto, where, if lucky, you may clean up yourself in a sea bath or a pile of filthy lucre at the roulette table. As our vessel steamed away from La Guayra, I thought what a magnificent city it was, from the stern of a ship. In Valencia, I read a placard in a church admonishing the men not to wink at the girls during service. The town had just been ravaged by a fever called Economica, because it was said the people caught it in the morning, languished in the afternoon, and died at night. At the Hotel Los Banos, Puerto Cabello, one goes in swimming au naturel. Many modest maidens are only clad in a blush, making a tableau vivant. Verily, as the guidebook saith, the natural beauties of the place are charming. The harbor is deep, so is the despair of the political prisoners who I saw working in rags. One poor fellow was toiling away stark naked among the breakers and sharp rocks. It is reported that the victims are beaten in the early morning during the call of the reveille to cover up their cries. Caracas, the capital of Venezuela, lies at a 3,000-foot hell elevation above the sea. It is the Paris of South America, with its churches, parks, public buildings, pantheon, palace, and promenades. The nerve center of the city is Plaza Bolivar, with an equestrian statue of the hero who stood for liberty, and around which congregate people who stand for everything. Certain characteristics make this a viva city and lubre city. The climate is cool, but tempered by the melting glance of the bonita muchachas, whose smiles would ripen peaches on a wall. The dapper yonkers of Caracas pursue their studies at the university and the senoritas on the highway. Their curriculum also includes the racetrack, bull ring, roulette wheel, as omnipresent as the Victoria coach wheel, and artworks imported from Paris and Barcelona, as vile and vivid as the paintings of Parhasius. Even picture portraits of Beethoven and Wagner are made by grouping together nude portions of female figures. Lottery tickets are not the only things sold in town. Mothers come to the plaza with their daughters for sale. Wantons from the suburb Lupinars solicit under shadows of the tree, and their hist, hist, is as familiar as the sibilant call of the feast publique in Paris, who figure so frequently in the tales of de Coq, Sue, and Maupassant. At Madame Gabby's mansion of shame, I found a girl scarcely twelve years old. How shocking! But one expects to be shocked in a city that is subject to earthquakes. Not only pedestrians, but pederasts, i.e., maricos or fairies, haunt the streets and parks of Caracas. Powdered and painted, they promenade with mincing gait and ogling glance, marching to the music of the band and making overtures to the bystanders. The police know of this disgusting depravity and of the hortal resorts for men only, but wink at it. This is as rank and rotten as anything I ever saw in Algiers or the Cairo fish market where men were dressed as women. In old Egypt, the temples of Isis were centers of disgusting filth. In ancient Greece, even among her greatest orators and philosophers, Socratic love was proverbial and portrayed on the stage in the plays of Aristophanes, although the Athenians officially punished it with death. Livy, in his History of Rome, castigates this heresy of love. The Ganymede pervert, Gaiton, is the hero of Petronius' sinister novel, Satyricon. Martial's epigrams and juvenile satires flay this moral decadence. Out from Naples, I visited the island of Capri, where the Roman goat emperor, Tiberius, hired companies of catamites for his entertainment. Domiton forbade the practice, while Christianity did much to suppress it. The student of history knows the infamous lives of Russian rulers and of Henry III of France in the 17th century. St. Paul scored the Romans for this sin. What an epistle could he indict against the Caracas Maricos, who amuse instead of disgust the Caracanians, who seem to believe with Baudelaire that la débauche et la mort sont deux amiables fils. Debauch and death are two amiable girls. The worst spot in Venezuela is the despot dictator, President Gomez. His authority is absolute with the accent on the loot. He takes what he wants, a man's personal property, wife, or daughter. Dark stories make him a modern bluebeard. He is a moral and physical leper. Rumor says that he sacrifices children and drinks their blood to cure his maladies. Gomez is the government, the legislative, executive, and judicial branches consisting of the cockpit, racetrack, and palace harem. He has panderers who scour the country to procure beautiful women for him. 
His personal and public character is so putrid that many of the inhabitants would like to elect him president of a guano island with a salary in guano. In the land of Bolivar, the liberator, Gomez muzzles the press, suppresses free speech, maintains an army of spies, and has imprisoned some of the best and brainiest men of Venezuela in horrible dungeons for the crime of loving liberty. The following would seem to be his daily prayer. Quote, My father which art in hell, powerful be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in Venezuela as it is in hell. Give me my daily bread, booze, and beef, whether everybody else starves or not. And forgive me my debts, but not as I forgive my debtors. And tempt me not into revolutions with my neighbors, and deliver me from the evil of any defeat. For thine and mine is the kingdom and the power and glory forever. Amen. End quote. Coffee, cacao, cane, cattle, corn, and illegitimate children are the principal products of the country. At one time, the official census for three years in Caracas gave legitimate births as 3,848 and illegitimate as 3,753. The ratio is even worse in the country districts. A Venezuela bachelor who hasn't a half-dozen mistresses has lost caste and is looked down on. A married man is expected to run two or three home establishments. Love is free, but drugs are costly. A friend of mine in the interior had a dear motherly lady come to him and offer her three daughters for five dollars a week. To said Alexander the Great wanted to destroy the antique town of Lamsacas because of its Priapus worship and obscene rites. Caracas was overturned by an earthquake in 1812 when 12,000 people perished. If that was a visitation of God's wrath on account of its wickedness, another punishment is due, for it is in the class of the cities of the plain. Quote, cities of hell with foul desires demented and monstrous pleasures hour by hour invented. End, quote. End of section 5. Read by Verla Vieira, Las Cruces, New Mexico, USA. Section 6 of Captain Billy's Whiz Bang, Volume 2, Number 20, May 1921. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alan Lawley. Captain Billy's Whiz Bang. Volume 2, Number 20, May 1921, by W. H. Forsett. Why Sergeants Are Light For a miserable hour, the new squad had been drilled by the sergeant, and then this army product remarked sweetly to the men, When I was a child, I had a set of wooden soldiers. There was this poor little boy in the neighbourhood, and after I had been to Sunday school one day and listened to a talk on the beauties of charity, I was soft enough to give them to him. Then I wanted them back and cried. But my mother said, Don't cry, Bertie. Some day you will get your wooden soldiers back. And believe me, you lopsided, mutton-headed, goofus brained set of certified rolling pins that day has come parley boo several officers were seated around the mess table in france one serious-minded major was in habit of taking a french girl out to lunch two or three times per week and taking a french lesson afterward how much do you figure your French lessons have cost you to date? queried one of his companions, winking around the board. Roughly? asked the major. No, respectably. Shocking. My brother Roscoe, who is a captain in the air service, tells the following. Officers in a garrison school were studying small problems for infantry. Turning to the large-sized map on the wall, the major instructor called upon one officer, Jones by name. Jones, said he, your battalion is camped here at Crossroads 435. 
indicating on map. It is enemy country, and you are told to cross this cornfield toward farmhouse, half mile distant, for the purpose of bringing in the farmer or somebody who might furnish information of the movements of the enemy. It is in September. The corn is cut, but not shocked. And, as you make your way across the field, you suddenly run into two young ladies. What do you do? I, I, I don't know, falteringly replied the second Louis. I didn't get time to study the lesson today. But did I understand you to say that the corn had not been shocked? End of section 6「Section 7 of Captain Billy's Whizbang, Volume 2, Number 20, May 1921. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Devin Eubanks. Captain Billy's Whizbang, Volume 2, Number 20, May 1921. By W. H. Fawcett. Questions and Answers. To Captain Billy through channels. It is requested that the captain give his expert advice on the following subjects. A. Girl in question insists on wearing filmy Georgette waists, which are just about as sufficient as chicken wire as far as concealment is concerned. There is no objection on my part to looking through them, but do not desire others to have same advantage. B. Passing along our main drag the other day, observed squab with brilliant green stockings. Promptly remembered General Order Number 2 and followed it out to best of my ability. When another one hove in sight with red, white, and blue effect on limbs. Puzzled to know which color to pay attention to in case it happens again. Gary Ed. Endorsements in reply. A. Which suggests that you drape your girl in question in heavier attire. B. You did perfectly right in observing both sets of stockings, as your general orders are, to walk my post in a military manner, observing everything that takes place within sight or hearing. Dear Captain Billy, what is most like a hen stealing? Dismal Dan. A cock robin, I suppose. Dear Bill, who is the lightweight champion of America? Private Stock. My coal dealer. Dear Captain Billy, what is a husband? Will be Schmelly. Husbands are very useful things to have about the house. Caught young, they make useful pets and can be taught to do a number of tricks. Some husbands are domesticated and stay at home in the evenings. I knew one who used to spend every evening at home. He suffered with gout. Others stay out late and then, having good friends, they get carried straight in. The duty of a husband is to touch the cash register and look pleasant. And so he spent his time trying to live round a 7 by 6 family on a 2 by 3 salary. Very few husbands ever live any longer than is absolutely necessary. Dear Whizbang Bill, my name is O. My brother Gus, he go away seven years ago to work in Minnesota milking cows. I go like to know if your hired man is my brother Gus, as you say in your magazine that your hired man Gus has strong feet. Old Skolstad. No, old, my hired man is not your brother. He says that all hired men have a bad odor about their petals due, he says, to the brand of snuff they snooze. Dear Skipper Bill, do you like popcorn balls? Sig or lighter? I don't know. I never was to one. 
Dear Whizbang Bill, what's the extreme penalty for bigamy? Ophelia Ankle, two mothers in law. Dear Skipper, my husband stays out every night and he always says he sits up with Jack, but he won't tell me his friend's last name. Can you advise me? Grace Gravy Dish. Your husband probably is attending Jack Pot. Dear Farmer Bill, as you are living on a farm, perhaps you may be able to give me the correct definition of a filly. Cobweb. A filly, my dear sir, is a lady horse that has never had a honeymoon. Dear Skipper, I've heard the expression, the evening wore on, and will you please tell me what it wore? Enormous nut. Must have been wearing the clothes of the day. Dear Skipper, what would you recommend as a good hair tonic? Run down Ike. Wine of pepsin. But I didn't think they used it on their hair anymore. Dear Captain Bill, how may I become popular as an aesthetic dancer? Miss Fit. Simply shiver and shake and look wicked. Dear Skipper, why is a sailor usually referred to as an old salt? Cap Pistol. After saltpeter, which is used so much in the Navy as an ingredient in the manufacture of high-explosive shells. Dear Captain Billy, what is a Peruvian pump? Gee, how it pants. An animal found only in the Arctic Circle and having two or more speeds. Dear Captain Bill, what's the difference between a model woman and a woman model, crazy cuckoo. A model woman is a bare possibility, while a woman model is a naked fact. Dear Professor Bill, what range of mountains did Napoleon cross, what year, and what mode of travel? Highly shocked. I'm not much of an historian. But I think it was in 1492 that Napoleon crossed the Rockies in a canoe. Dear Captain Bill, I have lived in the city all my life, but have decided to become a farmer. Can you tell me whether or not macaroni is a profitable crop to grow? Carcinoma. They don't grow macaroni anymore. They make it. Just take a big, long hole and put dough around it. I've been told that in some foreign countries, they use this hole for vermicelli. Limber Kicks Gabriel's Trump The young man led for a heart, the maid for a diamond played. The old man came down with a club, and the sexton used a spade. It wasn't the folly of Willie and Molly, nor the heat of the sun or the sands, that made Willie silly and Molly so jolly, t'was the whiz-bangs they had in their hands. Forgetful Maiden Here's to the girl who is mine, all mine. She drinks and she bets, and she smokes cigarettes. And sometimes I'm told she goes out and forgets that she's mine, all mine. Quick, Mama, the handkerchief. The little boy had quite a cold, the weather it was hot. I said, is that sweat on your lip? He said, no, sir, it's not. End of Section 7《Section 8 of Captain Billy's Whiz Bang, Volume 2, Number 20, May 1921. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org.
Captain Billy's Whiz Bang, Volume 2, Number 20, May 1921, by W. H. Fawcett. Whiz Bang Editorials. The Bull is Mightier Than the Bullet. Less than two short years ago, the Whiz Bang was founded, upon my return from the Army, on the Whiz Bang Farm, hoping in so doing that the veterans and their friends of Robbinsdale and vicinity would be supplied with the samples of the pep and ginger we had in the Army and Navy and Marine Corps. In our opening number, we expressed a faint hope for big time sometime, and that we could follow in the footsteps of the Cherry Sisters of Vaudeville. Our hopes and aspirations have been more than fulfilled. In twenty months, without the aid of advertising or circulation campaigns, and without a single subscription agent in the field, we have grown from 3,500 circulation in October 1919 to more than 300,000 guaranteed paid circulation with this issue, May 1921. America surely has given us a grand reception, and we are grateful. Next month we are planning on letting our Canadian neighbors get our bundle of farm philosophy, and as quickly as newsstands can be communicated with, we will open up new territory. Here's thanks to you folks, one and all, and we want you to consider yourself as associate editors. If you have a story or a joke or a question for Captain Billy to answer, or a verse or prose or a catchy saying, send it in. And as a grand finale, so to speak, the whiz-bang will stay in the fight for the rights of all mankind to enjoy that liberty, the full measure of our personal and national liberty, for which we bucked the bean line in khaki and blue in the recent war. We will stand firmly opposed to any invasion of our inherent rights to the pursuit of happiness, health, and prosperity. The roll of the drum is anything but humdrum. The eardrum recognizes the sound of a drum whether the instrument is side, snare, brass, or kettle. In travel I have seen and heard drums big and little, round, cylindrical, high and low, loud and soft, wild and weird, played by head, hand, and foot, played fast and slow in life and death, peace and war, played by savage and by civilized man in the desert or orchestra hall. Savages, whose natural argument was a blow on the head to beat out their enemy's brains, naturally fell into a percussion style of music and invented the drum, often the sole as well as the chief musical instrument. The drum figures in this world from religion to ragtime, from the Salvation Army to the jazz band. Deborah's timbrel was a sort of drum. The old tom-tom at an Indian snake charming doubtless had its counterpart in Egypt in 1600 B.C., and one listens to that same noise in modern Cairo. The dull sound that wakened my dreams in the Alhambra was from a drum the Moor had brought from the East after a crusade. Music is a universal language, and the despised, unmusical drum has a polyglot tongue. All other musical instruments have their speech of sentiment, love, and emotion, but the voice of the drum knows the eloquent language of liberty and can get more volunteers for God, home, and native land than all the orators. The roll of the drum, like that of the sea, fills the soul's shoreline and its every bay and gulf. Hine says that history of the storming of the Bastille cannot be correctly understood until we know how the drumming was done. The reveille of the drum means that it is time to get up, and there is a fable of its resurrection meaning in the old legend of soldiers, fallen in battle, who by night rose from the grave in the battlefield, and with drummer at their head, marched back to their native home. There is a pathetic story in French history of Napoleon's nameless drummer boy being swept from the ranks by the sudden dash of an avalanche into an alpine valley. He was uninjured, and the drum still hung suspended from his neck. He waved his hands to the soldiers two hundred feet above him and began to drum, playing the tattoo, the reveille, the advance, and the charge. But there was no time to rescue him. The soldiers passed on, and the last thing they heard in the clear cold air was the beat of a funeral march. Then the little drummer boy lay on the snowbank to die, with the snow for his shroud and the falling night for his pall. For years the veterans of the Italian campaign hushed their voices at the campfire as they told the story of Napoleon's drummer boy whose slender body lay frozen beside his drum in the silent solitudes of the snowy Alps. In patriotic art we have the spirit of 76. Germany has used the drum as a favorite means to raise recruits. We have done it against her, and by God's grace will give her a drumhead court-martial before long. 
though the world is waiting for the time Tennyson speaks of, when the war drum throbs no longer. The drum is the heartbeat of a liberty-loving humanity. The Fourth of July drum recalls the spirit of 1917, when Uncle Sam started to make the world habitable, and we prayed that the American eagle might beat out the brains of Germany's two-headed vulture. Recalls the spirit of the Spanish War to give Cuba and the Philippines human rights. Recalls the War of the Rebellion for the Union of All Creeds, Colors, and Conditions. Recalls the War of Mexico for a square deal for Americans. Recalls the War of 1812 for free commerce of our ships upon the high seas. Recalls the War of 1776 for liberty by the noble colonists. I believe in the drum. Can you beat it? Hurrah for Uncle Sam, the drum major of the world, in the march for freedom of body, mind, and soul, always and everywhere. Several persons of our acquaintance have asked why we refer to marriage in the same sentence with war. There is no difference. A fellow meets a girl and decides that she is the woman he wants to battle through life with. You present arms and she falls in. You talk it over and decide on an engagement. At the Marriage License Bureau, you sign up. A minister swears you in. There are only a few skirmishes during the courtship. The real fighting starts after marriage. That's when a man thinks he's a colonel, and he's only a nut. In the house, as well as on the battlefield, they use hand grenades, such as flat irons, pots, and rolling pins. The wife is usually a good rifler. She rifles your pockets every night, takes your large money, and confines you to quarters. Whether you have done anything or not, she always has you on the mess detail. She makes her counterattacks in the department stores, and she knows how to charge. She is your commanding officer, and you are her supply officer. In the game, the fiercest fight is always to come. Wait until the infantry arrives. Instead of shouldering arms, you shoulder the baby. On the battlefields, shells may screech and scream, but they have nothing on the kid. You get your walking papers every night. This is the only hike you take. In war, you sign up for four years. There is no such clause as that in your wedding certificate. You can get exemption from war on account of marriage, but you can't get exempt from marriage on account of war. One outrage pulpit orator states that when the average society girl enters the ballroom in these depraved times, she has on only four garments. But we take it for granted he didn't count shoes and stockings in making up his estimate. Now one of our most eminent medical scientists announces that hiccups may be stopped immediately by placing one's index finger on the patient's fifth cervicular nerve and pressing hard. But we must find out definitely where the fifth cervicular nerve is before trying this simple remedy on the next hiccuping girlfriend we happen to be with. A little fun occasionally is all right, but life is too short and too serious to spend it all around the monkey cage. Stop, look, listen. I do not fear a siren with a mass of midnight hair, with wicked drooping eyelids and a blasé worldly air. But, oh, I cross my fingers, and I breathe a little prayer, when I meet a blonde-haired cutie with a blue-eyed baby stare. End of Section 8 Read by Scotty Smith Section 9 of Captain Billy's Whiz-Bang, Volume 2, Number 20, May 1921 this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Jonathan Pruitt. Captain Billy's Whiz Bang, Volume 2, Number 20, May 1921, by W. H. Fawcett. Smokehouse Poetry, Part 1. Another red blooded verse dedicated to the great American rambler will appear in the Whizbang for June, the Gila Monster Route, being a tale of the hobo on the Southern Pacific Sunset Route. Excerpts from the poem give the swing. A poor old seedy half-starved bow, on a hostile pike without a show, neath a cactus tree with sand piled deep, on the Gila Route came his last long sleep.
Recently, Whizbang received a letter from the cell house of the Alcatraz Federal Penitentiary, located on an island overlooking San Francisco, the dread of the army. And in this letter was a pathetic poem from a prisoner who begs that we publish it for the benefit of humans on The Great Outside. To be beaten and thrown in a dungeon, where the eyes of mankind are blind, to be left for dead in this hellhole of dread, eternally losing your mind. This appeal will also appear in the June Whizbang. So many calls have been received at the Whizbang Farm for back copies containing certain smokehouse poems that we've decided to put out a book containing many of the gems of past issues, as well as new red blooded poems to be ready for our readers early this fall. The Book of Smokehouse Poetry will be in addition to our new winter annual Follies 39 of 1921 to 22, which will be ready for you in October with all new stuff. Jokes, jingles, stories, prose, poetry, poopery, advice to lovelorn and love shorn, and oh, we just hate to tell you of the many bright surprises. We've also had many calls for the works of Robert W. Service, which we must refer to the publishers Barson Hopkins, 21 Division Street, Newark, New Jersey. Or Ever the Nightly Years Were Gone by William Ernst Henley. Or ever the nightly years were gone, with the old world to the grave, I was a king in Babylon, and you were a Christian slave. I saw, I took, I cast you by, I bent and broke your pride. You loved me well, or I heard them lie, but your longing was denied. Surely I knew that by and by you cursed your gods and died. And a myriad suns have set and shone since then upon the grave, decreed by the king of Babylon to her that had been his slave. The pride I trampled is now my scathe, for it tramples me again. The old resentment lasts like death, for you love, yet you refrain. I break my heart on your hard unfaith, and I break my heart in vain. Yet not for an hour do I wish undone the dead beyond the grave, when I was a king in Babylon, and you were a virgin slave. Toledo Slim Whizbang has received so many requests for Toledo Slim that we will herewith publish this virile poem of the underworld. We were seated in a pool room on a cold December day, telling jokes and funny stories just to pass the time away. When the door was softly opened and a form walked slowly in, all the boys soon stopped their kidding when they saw Toledo Slim. But a different man was he, and they hardly knew the guy. He no longer wore the glad rags he had worn in days gone by. He took a look around him as he crept into the place, and we saw a look of hunger on his dirty, grimy face. Hello, Slim, old pal, said Boston Red. You're looking on the pork. Why, you used to be the swellest guy of any in New York. Come, tell us, Slim, what happened that you are on the bum? The crowd then gathered round him, and the story Slim begun. Tis true I'm on the bum, boys, I'm on the hog for fair. But in the past I led them all, my role was always there. I never turned an old pal down, I spent my money free, and all the sports along the line were glad to stick with me. I was an all-round hustler, I trimmed the birdies right, I never shied at any game when greenbacks were in sight. But one sad night, I met my fate, I fell like many more, that's how I'm on the bum, boys, played out and feeling sore. It happened just five years ago, if I remember right. I trimmed a sucker for a roll and felt most out of sight. I took a stroll along the line, set up for all the boys, and just to pass the time away, I dropped in Kid McCoy's. And while I sat there drinking, getting on a mighty stew, a dead swell dame came in the place and sat beside me too. I asked her if she'd have a drink. She sweetly said she would. And as I gazed into her eyes, I thought I understood. Perhaps you'll think me fickle pals, but it 
isn't any dream. For when it comes to peachy looks, that Tommy was the queen. We chewed the rag for quite a while, I shot the con for fair. And when it comes to spreading salve, you may gamble I was there. I told her I would place her in a finely furnished flat. And when the joint closed up that night, I had my girly pat. Next day we saw the parson and paid a month's rent down. And then she went hustling for work around the town. She'd get up in the morning, go out and get the grub, while I lay in my downy bed so humble and so snug. But if the day proved gloomy, then in the house we'd stop. She'd gather round the layout while I cooked the fragrant hop. When winter drew around at last and things were going fine, we had the swellest flat of any couple on the line. One night, I had a job to do, the richest home in town. I got my tools and started out with my pal, Jackie Brown. We never thought we'd get a blow, the thing looked like a pipe, with all the folks asleep in and not a soul in sight. We put the goods into a sheet and started down the block, and just as luck would have it, we bumped into a cop. We dropped the swag as quick as flash and started on the run, with the copper close behind us a-shooting off his gun. But we were as fleet as greyhounds, and we were halfway down the street when a bullet hit me in the leg, and I knew that I was beat. The copper stopped to handcuff me while Jackie got away, and I never saw his face again for many and many a day. Well, boys, I know you'll guess the rest. They made short work of me. They sent me up the river to do my little V. But still, I did not worry. I thought my girl would stick and keep the flat a-going while I did my little trick. I never thought she'd turn me down in 40,000 years. But when I think of what came of it, it almost brings the tears. At last, the long years passed away, and one bright summer day, I started back to old New York so happy and so gay. But when I reached my little flat, I found my girl had flown. She had run away with Jackie and left me all alone. It was then I took to boozing and went from bad to worse. I tried to drown my sorrow and forget the bitter curse. But the memory of that pretty face was always on my mind. So I searched the city over, but no trace of her could find. I roamed the streets at leisure, sinking vainly for my prey looking for the man that ruined me and stole my girl away. I swore that I'd have his life for the trick that he had done, so I searched the country everywhere, knowing well that my time would come. One day I met a wise guy who knew my pal full well. He said he was in Frisco and living mighty swell. The girl had died in Denver of consumption, so he said, where my former pal had left her to starve for want of bread. It happened at a time, boys, when I didn't have a cent. So I beat my way to Frisco with my mind on vengeance bet. One foggy day on Market Street, I met him sure as fate. He tried to get the drop on me, but was a moment late. I sent a bullet crashing into the traitor's brain, and then I made my getaway and glommed an eastbound train. That's all there is to tell, boys. I'm like the rest of bums. I've lost all my ambition and don't care what becomes. And as he finished talking, from his hip he drew a gun. In a moment came a sharp report. His grafting days were done. End of section 9section 10 of Captain Billy's Whiz Bang, Volume 2, Number 20, May. 1921. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Jonathan Pruitt. Captain Billy's Whiz Bang, Volume 2, Number 20, May 1921, by W. H. Fawcett. Smokehouse Poetry, Part 2. The Midnight Glide of Pauline Revere. Listen, my children, and you shall hear of the famous wife of Paul Revere. While Paul flivered out on his midnight ride, you think she camped at the old fireside? Emphatically no. But, like the modern girl, she busted right out for a shimmy world. 
She parked where the lights were glowing bright to do a few steps of the hold me tight. She copped a partner, a boy from college, who just returned from a hall of knowledge. With the bean chuck full of mule and school, this rah-rah boy was a dancing fool. They dangled a hoof and shook them all, from the front porch swing to the downstairs fall. When the band started jazzing that song of repose, of just kiss me doc and burn all my clothes, they would clinch and grapple in a vice-like embrace, and he'd plant his map up the side of her face. With his right lunch hook, her waist he'd entwine, you'd almost think he was massaging her spine. And thus clamped together they would trot and trip, and shake all the movements of the slovenly slip, the kitchen sink and the boxcar bump, the cedar step and the public dump, the old board walk and the arctic shiver, the backyard dash and the St. Vitus quiver, the old milkshake and the slippery slide, the wormy wiggle and the Peruvian glide. The moral is this, when all's done and said, why go to a dance when you got music at home? W.K. Edwards The Anxious Dead In the April issue, the Whizbang published the noted poem of Lieutenant Colonel John McRae in Flanders Field. Here is his other masterpiece, The Anxious Dead, and also America's Answer by R. W. Liard and Poppies by J. Eugene Chrisman by Lieutenant Colonel John McRae. O oh, guns, fall silent till the dead men hear, above their heads the legions passing on, those who fought their fight in time of bitter fear, and died not knowing how the day had gone. O oh, flashing muzzle, pause and let them see the coming dawn that streaks the sky afar. Then let your mighty chorus witness be to them and Caesar that we still make war. Tell them, O oh guns, that we have heard their call, that we have sworn we will not turn aside, that we will onward till we win or fall, that we will keep the faith for which they died. Bid them be patient, and some day anon they shall feel earth enwrapped in silence deep, shall greet in wonderment the quiet dawn, and in content may turn them to their sleep. America's Answer by R. W. Liard Rest ye in peace, ye Flanders dead, the fight that ye so bravely led, we've taken up, and we will keep true faith with you who lie asleep, with each a cross to mark his bed, and poppies blowing overhead, where once his own life blood ran red. So let your rest be sweet and deep in Flanders' fields. Fear not that ye have died for naught, the torch ye threw to us we caught. Ten million hands will hold it high and freedom's light will never die. We've learned the lesson that ye taught in Flanders' fields. Poppies by J. Eugene Crisman Poppies? Not for me, buddy. Buds of hell, I'd call them. Plain red hell, they... They remind me, and folks plant them around. Gardens, huh? Says one old dame to me. Don't they bring back, says she? The poppied fields of Flanders? Poppied fields of... Ain't that a hell of a... Who wants them brung back, huh? Say, buddy, if she'd seen poppies, like I've seen them, millions, acres, scattered through the wheat fields, red and getting redder. Mostly poppies, yeah, mostly. Slim. My buddy, old scout, slept under the same handkerchief. Me and Slim, clean through from the word go. I'm liable to forget, ain't I? The day we kicked off west of old Chateau Thierry, down the valley. Poppies, say. You couldn't rest for poppies. Then the Jerry's cut loose. Machine gun fire, regular sickle. Poppy leaves, bits of red, flicking and fluttering in the wind. Mowed em, buddy, and us, I'd tell the world. Got old Slim, got him right. Down in the poppies he goes, kicking, clawing. Don't talk poppies to me. Skunk cabbage first, compris? 
If you'd seen old Slim, boy, he died wallering in poppies. Poppies. Hell. Our Lonely Lovesick Gob This poem was not written by Kipling, nor has it passed the scrutiny of our village schoolmaster. But what it lacks in rhetoric is made up in punch. I made this up about a girl that turned me down over a shipmate of mine, and will thank you to publish it for the benefit of other lovesick gobs, writes the author, a sailor at the Philadelphia Naval Station. Now listen, shipmates, listen, and I shall tell to you how once I met a girly, just like other fellows do. I loved her, yes, I loved her, and I know she knew it well. But I tipped her to a shipmate, and he held her in his spell. He enraptured her with stories, and he said I was not true. When next I met my loved one, she said, I'm through with you. I've told you all I know, boys, or all I care to tell. So if you love a girly gobs, have your shipmates. Go to hell. Human Nature Absence makes the heart grow fonder. Peroxide makes the blonde grow blonder. Onions make the breath grow stronger. But bunk makes the grass grow longer. I love a lassie. She's skinny, but she's classy. She's neat as the paper on the wall. She's got a face like a dragon, a shape like a horse in a wagon. She's my lassie of the Scotch mask ball. Soldier's Prayer now I lay me down to sleep, I pray thee please my soul to keep. Grant no other soldier take my shoes and socks before I wake. Try and guard me in my sleep and keep my bunk upon its feet. And in the morning let me wake, breathing whiffs of sirloin steak. Please protect me in my dreams and make it better than it seems. Grant the time may swiftly fly when I myself may rest or try. In a snowy feather bed, with a pillow neath my head, far away from all these scenes, from the smell of hash and beans, take me back into the land where they don't scrub down with sand. And thou knowest all my woes, feed me in my dying throes. Take me back, and I promise thee never more to cross the sea. My Sarah Jane She's knock-kneed, she's lazy, she's bow-legged, she's crazy. She's mall eyed she's wall-eyed, she's lame. Well, her teeth are all false from indulging in salts. She's my cock-eyed, consumptive, plain Jane. My Girl My girl was the best of girls. Her curls were the prettiest of curls. No girl had lips so sweet. No girl had such dainty feet. My girl never told a lie, not even to me. What a shame my girl must die at the age. Of three. End of section ten. Section eleven of Captain Billy's Whiz Bang, Volume Two, Number Twenty, May nineteen twenty one. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Jonathan Pruitt. Captain Billy's Whiz Bang, Volume 2, Number 20, May 1921, by W. H. Fawcett. Bud's Bundle of Bunk, by Bud L. McKillops, author of After the Raid. This talk of blue laws gets my goat. Reformers make me sore. I'd like to take them by the throat and kick them through the door. Time was I used to drink some beer and maybe sing a song. Perhaps I got soast once a year, and didn't think it was wrong. But now if I desire a drink, some basement I must find, and if I get by with a wink, perhaps I may go blind. The beer I drank was harmless stuff, t'was made of hops and grain. The hooch today is made of snuff, ground glass, and paint and rain. Three weeks ago I took a drink, just one, I took no more. If I'd had two... I really think I'd have whipped an army corps. The one I took was bad enough. It stood me on my neck. And then I started to get rough and made the place a wreck. Somebody called three policemen in. 
They sat upon my brow and kicked me underneath the chin. I've got the marks there now. A riot call brought out more troops who battered me with clubs, then locked me in the city coops with ninety other dubs. My friends chipped in and paid my fine of thirty thousand bucks. The doctors patched my head and spine. That cost five hundred shucks. When I got well, my friends I told I'd never drink again. But soon I caught a beastly cold that filled my soul with pain. In olden days I'd hit the hay and half a pint of crow. And sure as fate, in half a day the cold was sure to go. This time I hunted up a doc and told him of my ills. His heart was harder than a rock. He gave me quinine pills. I took the pills to the lagoon and fed them to the ducks. Then bought a quart of fresh-made moon that cost me seven bucks. That night in bed I took a shot to drive the cold away. I woke up in a vacant lot at 10 a.m. the next day. From now on henceforth I am through with booze that makes me fight, with elephants of vivid hue and sleeping trees at night. No more I'll sample raisin ski that causes such turmoil. I'll take a chance on TNT, bay rum, or croton oil. There's not much fun in life because there's not but woe and pain that's come from passing foolish laws. I guess I'll go to Spain. Well, he's someplace. Jenkins made some hoochah raisins, yeast potatoes, let it stand for three weeks, then tried to drink it. Now he's with the angel band. Candy Kisses I went to kiss my girl goodnight, and she had no teeth. Every time I kissed her, I saw a gum drop. End of section 11. Section 12 of Captain Billy's Whiz Bang, Volume 2, Number 20, May 1921. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Jonathan Pruitt. Captain Billy's Whiz Bang, Volume 2, Number 20, May 1921, by W. H. Fawcett. Pasture Potpourri. I can't place you, but your breath smells familiar. A cold one. It isn't the cough that carries you off, it's the coffin they carry you off in. Never steal a watch, because a lawyer will eventually get the case, and you the works. I want a girl, and I want her bad. Gus's favorite song. The old gray mare, she sits on the whipple tree, she sits on the whipple tree, sits on the whipple tree. The old gray mare, she sits on the whipple tree, all the whole day long. Is your boss broad-minded? I should say so, he was out with two last night. Pat and Mike staggered weakly to the rail of the pitching liner. Begora, said Pat. I don't blame Christ for walking. If ignorance is a blister, don't be an abscess. Girls, whatever you do, don't get married. Bring your children up the same way. Women can do things manly, and do them without a frown. But when she starts to climb a tree, it's time to call her down. Love is like hash. You must have confidence to enjoy it. No, Geraldine. Just because a cranky woman is sometimes called an old cat is no reason you should refer to a voting woman as a pole cat. Now, Mary had a swarm of bees. She loved their buzzing lives. They also loved their Mary because their Mary had the hives. Our motto for May. You're a million miles from nowhere when you hold her dainty hand. Since the Dutch Room Raid Here's to San Diego, the best town all around. Here's to dear old Boston, the city of the sound. Here's to good Chicago that once was up to date. And here's to Minneapolis, she's been so dead of late. We lost our good spirit when they took away our booze. End of section 12. Section 13 of Captain Billy's Whizbang, Volume 2, Number 20, 
May 1921. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Lauren Fontaine. Captain Billy's Whizbang, Volume 2, Number 20, May 1921, by W. H. Fawcett. Classified Ads Waiting on the corner from the Des Moines Register. Will the elderly gentleman, owner of the Cadillac sedan, who left Young Widow on 6th Avenue a week before Christmas, let me hear from him through this paper? Strictly confidential. Convalescent, from the Montezuma, Colorado Journal. A. O. Lindquist, who was married three weeks ago, is able to be out again and will likely be able to assume his duties as a carpenter and contractor soon. Come One, Come All, from the Marengo Republican News. Baptist Church, 7.30 p.m. Popular evening service. Subject, Fools and Idiots. A large number are expected. The church was packed, from the Miller S.D. Press. Next Sunday morning, the minister is going to, in his sermon, reveal how to meet the demand for wine. The superintendent of the Sunday school announces that the supplies for the quarter are at hand and may be secured by the teachers at the church. Oh, very well. From the Kewanee Star Courier. Notice, I have been getting numerous calls for nursing. I wish not to be called as my health does not permit me to overdo. Especially, I have two canaries and house flowers to care for. I may, when weather gets warmer, take a few cases. Mrs. Lizzie Hogg. 638 Pine. Add Signs of Spring from the Omaha World Herald. Female cinnamon color canary wants to mate. Walnut, 1936. Accommodating from Seattle Times. Mrs. Hausman can accommodate two or three young men. 721 9th Avenue, Elliott, 2161. Or any old color from Pittsburgh Press. Black or white? What about it? Margaret Livingston, Ince Movie Star, says white stockings make the legs appear larger and more shapely. She'd get our vote in red ones. Some negligee Peggy has. No, dear, you're wrong. Negligee is wearing apparel. And a child shall lead them, from Memphis Commercial Appeal. Housekeeper wanted at once. Must have a child, by a widower, sixty years of age. Nice furnished home and farm. We'll give an interest. Woodlawn Farm, Havana, Ark. West Side or Outside, from Grand Rapids Press. Wanted. Breast milk. Must be on West Side. 66101. The Way It Was Done, from East Peoria Post. New Year's Day, our young friends Miss Hattie Cochran and Mr. Elias King, without any ceremony at all, were united in the bonds of holy wedlock. They make the best kind, from the Oberlin O. Tribune. Wanted. A husband. Must be a sinner. None other need apply. P.O. Box 61, Oberlin. End of Section 13《セクション14 of Captain Billy's Whizbang, Volume 2, Number 20, May 1921. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Oogie's Ragdoll. Captain Billy's Whizbang, Volume 2, Number 20, May 1921, by W. H. Fawcett. Musings of a Bachelor There are three kinds of females, foolish girls, damn foolish girls, and married women. Strong perfume has never yet become an excuse for not bathing. When a man becomes so well acquainted with a girl that she tells him, Now stop! He is fairly well acquainted. Most men have quit wearing suspenders, but that's about all some women wear. There are a number of ways to kiss a girl, but only one way to kiss a married woman. A girl with a quart of hooch is more popular these days than the girl with a ton of good looks. Telephone girls who say over the wire, number please, are the same ones who at home shout, hey, pass them spuds. 
Long ago, I was taught that all is not gold that glitters, and more recently, I found that all who flap are not flappers. Girls who live in glass houses should always pull down the shades. Girls with highly polished fingernails are generally the ones with runs in silk hosiery. When women get their heads together and whisper, we're talking about some other woman. When men do the same, they're discussing the latest recipe for homemade hooch. A woman who will faint at the sight of a mouse will tell you that the prize fight she saw was very tame. A friend of mine wanted to buy a vamp table. I didn't know what a vamp table was. He said it was a table with straight legs and without anything on top. There are some girls who, at a theater, insist upon whispering to their escort that the man on the other side is trying to flirt with me. Chewing tobacco seems to have passed out with booze and suspenders. A real man nowadays wears a belt and a wristwatch and smokes pills. Somebody has said recently that jazz music is the voice of the devil, but who the devil cares? When a woman threatens to scream, you can be sure she won't. An optimist is a member of the bartender's union who is still paying dues. There are some married women who would like to play football providing there weren't any goalposts. A boxer who fights his battles in the ring instead of in the columns of the newspapers is a sufficient attraction these days to merit considerable attention. A young woman tries to please man. When she gets old, she tries to please God. It's a long way from Los Angeles to Palm Beach, but the styles and bathing suits of the Max Senate queens and the dames of high society seem about the same. Electric lights were never made for courting. In the days of the gas jet, a fellow could turn down the light a little at a time. Now he has to snap off electricity all at once and take a chance. There may be a good many arguments against the restoration of the good old 4% beer, but right now you can't think of a single one. There were more divorces, more murders, more burglaries in New York in 1920 than in 1919. Hooray for Prohibition! As we remember the arguments of the prohibitionists, a dry country would be nothing short of utopia. There wasn't going to be any crime, nor any marital difficulties, nor were any young girls going to go wrong. It is a merry world, my masters. It costs so much nowadays to get a house to live in, and enough booze for the housewarming that there isn't anything left for furniture. My love for you, my pretty one, is like a beacon light. It smolders in the daytime, but burneth bright at night. She tends the locks upon the dam. He tries not to offend her. For fear she'll fire him off the job. In fact, he's too damn tender. End of section 14. Section 15 of Captain Billy's Whiz Bang, Volume 2, Number 20, May 1921. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alan Lawley. Captain Billy's Whiz Bang, Volume 2. Number 20, May 1921, by W. H. Forsett. Our Rural Mailbox Bell, we can't use your story, but you win the diamond-studded stomach pump. Sweet Marie, the bridegroom should not see the bride on the day of the wedding until he meets her in the church or in front of Court Commissioner Bates. However, if you have any apprehensions, you might ask your big brother to keep an eye on him. Men are so fickle, you know. Dolly, it is not, generally speaking, correct to send invitations for the wedding and christening simultaneously. Circumstances quite often alter cases, however. Will E. Crowder, you should not doubt. Did you not say you met her walking home after an automobile ride? Grace, congratulations. A baby will make love stronger. 
days shorter, nights longer, bank rolls smaller, home happier, and clothes shabbier. I know, for I've brought up five of them. Deep Stuff A young man who hailed from Thief River made love to his girl in a fliver. The car hit a tree. She cried, Oh dear me, I fear I have fractured my liver. Cannibalism A handsome young flyer named Slater loved madly a girl in Decatur. One night in the rain they eloped in his plane. They came now, that young aviator. Sing this merrily. Roses are red, violets are blue. You chase me, and I'll chase you. Treat him rough. She gazed into his angry eyes, and he gazed back at her. With brow as dark as stormy skies, he told her what she were. His fingers circled round her neck. He kicked her in the slats. Then as he searched for broom and mop, he cried, Go, darn those cats. End of section 15「Section 16 of Captain Billy's Whizbang, Volume 2, Number 20, May 1921. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Lauren Fontaine. Captain Billy's Whizbang, Volume 2, Number 20, May 1921, by W. H. Fawcett. Just Jokes and Jingles In Memoriam To a chemistry student who drank sulfuric acid thinking it was water. Here lies the remains of William Doe. Now he is no more. For what he thought was H2O was H2SO4. Mrs. Murphy was getting the supper for the children on Saturday night when a young woman came to her door. I'm a collector for the drunkard's home, she said. Could you help us? Come around tonight and I'll give you Murphy, she replied as she went on with her work. Elsie had a little light. She had trained it, no doubt. Cause every time that William called, that little light went out. Just like a wife. Two more cases of talking sickness have been reported. It is needless to say that both of them are women. Life. Chapter 1. Glad to meet you. Chapter 2. Isn't the moon beautiful? Chapter 3. Just one more, dear, please. Chapter 4. Do you? I do. Chapter 5. Dada, dada. Chapter 6. We're in L's dinner. Anatomy students, attention. Terre Haute, Indiana, post. Gertrude Hoffman, classic dancer, was considering the advisability of muzzling her pet snake today. While she was dancing the Princess of Raha last night, the reptile bit her on the left leg between the overture and the climax. These stockings were all in this world, she said, that my poor mother left to me. The lawyer said, as the will he read, what a beautiful legacy. My God, dearie. We see by the public print where Richard G. Badger is the author of a new book on Nervous Children, Their Prevention and Management. One Day or Full Climax A French officer, a military attaché in Washington, was invited to a golden wedding, had a fine time, and desired to thank his host upon departing. Had the grand evening, quoth he. The American is very nice to the Frenchman but I would very much like to know what is this golden wedding. His host explained in detail that he and his better half had been living together for fifty long years in perfect harmony and accord. Wonderful, wonderful, exclaimed the Frenchman, patting his hands together excitedly. And now, after fifty years, this wonderful wedding. A Twice-Told Tale a teddy bear sat on the ice, as cold as cold could be. 
but soon he up and walked away. My tale is told, said he. There's a limit, said he. Sweet maiden, ere we part, believe me, I can see that you possess a loving heart, a heart that beats for me. Great Scott, the maiden murmured low beneath her wide-brimmed hat. I didn't realize I was so decollete as that. Prohibition agents rush in where bootleggers fear to tread. Some bugler. Two soldiers in a Negro regiment, says the gold chevron, were boasting about their company buglers. Go along with you, boy, said one. You ain't got no buglers. We has got the boogler, and when that boy wraps his lips around that horn and blows pay call, it sounds just like a symphony band playing. Well, if you like music, that's all right. But if you's yearning for food, you wants a boogler with a hypnotic note like we's got. Boy, when I hears old Custard Mouth Jones discharge his blast, I looks at my beans and I says, Strawberries, behave yourselves. You's crowding all the whipped cream out of my dish. Ching Wong Long and Ching Fong Louie started in to eat chop suey. They ate and ate until they died. Did they commit chop suicide? More Latin. Boyabus kissabus girlabusorum. Girlabus likeabus wantusamorum. Papabus hereabus kissabusorum. Kickabus boyabus out of the dorum. Darkabus nightabus no lightabusorum. Climabus gatepost breachabustorum. Remember, my son, that a giggling girl is apt to become a cackling woman. Those dreadful drummers. Four or five jolly drummers gathered in the smoking compartment of a Pullman car, and soon their conversation drifted to the great problem of the day, women. In the party also was a frock-coated pastor of serious mien. The salesmen winked at each other as the minister entered, and then, as if to have some harmless pleasure, one after another started telling of the wonderful virtues of the Knights of the Grip. I am often away from home for four weeks at a time, one salesman commenced and I never even look at another woman. And I am so bound up in the charms of my wife that I'm ashamed to tip the check girls, declared the next one. Why, my wife is so good to me that I won't allow a woman to wait on me in a restaurant, said another. Their conversation sounded too much like unadulterated bunk for the good minister to swallow, and he joined the party by offering a silk hat to any salesman present who could truthfully say he had always been faithful to his wife. The pastor won his point, and the conversation soon drifted to other subjects. The next day, one of the salesmen arrived home and soon told his wife of the jolly party in the Pullman smoker. But John, she said, why didn't you take him up? John's active salesman brain worked quickly. Why, Mabel, you know I look like hell in a silk hat. It was ocean blood. A whiz bang gob writes to ye editor and asserts that our story in the April issue about the Scotchman who was hurt while carrying hooch was incorrect, in that the real hero was a sailor. This is the true history of the case, he avers. The gob was coming down the street with two bottles under his peacoat when he saw a fellow shipmate in a fight with three men across the way. He promptly sailed across and waded in. In fifteen minutes or so, he heaved to as he felt a warm liquid running down his side. Rolling his eyes heavenward, he groaned, Oh, gosh, I hope I'm stabbed. She was a sweet and pretty miss, so dainty and demure. She lived down by the racetrack, and all the horsemen knew her. Don't dress that hen inside the house, the wife was heard to mutter. All right, said he, I'll stand outside upon the curb and gutter. The Hope of the Fat the incorrigible joker stood outside the great synagogue as the chosen were pouring out, last Shabazz, and declaimed, There is a divinity that shapes our ends, rough-hew them as we may. And a fat, greasy-looking little man sidled up to him and wheezed, Do you want to see the rabbi, mister? You can't fool him at all. He had been married about six months, during which time he had made the most strenuous endeavors to abandon his former naughty ways, and to give up his intemperate bachelor friends, and the numerous pretty ladies with whom he had so long been associated. But it happened one day that he fell in with a very dear friend, 
till in a somewhat dazed condition he eventually fetched up at his home suite round about five o'clock on the following morning. Stealthily he crept upstairs to bed, and wifey being, as he imagined, asleep, equally stealthily did he start to undress in the cold grey light of dawn. For a time, all went well. Then suddenly a voice rose above the stillness. Charles, where's your vest? Charles pulled himself together rapidly and endeavored to review the situation. My dear, he replied confidentially after much mental effort, upon my soul I believe I must have left it. In the cab. Unlucky months for getting married. January. February. March. April. May. June. July. August. September. October, November, December. My girl brought me a basket of eggs. As she stepped up the steps, I said, What beautiful eggs! And when she reached me, she slapped my face. End of Captain Billy's Whizbang, Volume 2, Number 20, May 1921, by W. H. Fawcett.